Welcome everyone. My name is Kara Burke, a pharmacist in the Division of Drug Information. I would like to welcome you to this educational activity sponsored by the FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, Office of Communications, Division of Drug Information. All right, today's webinar is titled FDA Drug Topics, Understanding Generic Narrow Therapeutic Index Drugs. Before I introduce our speaker, I have a few housekeeping remarks. All faculty are expected to use generic names. If trade names are used, those of several companies should be used rather than only that of a single supporting company. Unapproved use disclosure. CE faculty speakers are required to disclose to the attendees when products or procedures being discussed are off-label, unlabeled, not FDA approved, and any limitations on the information that is presented. Disclosure. The faculties planning committee members, and the FDA CE consultation and accreditation team have nothing to disclose. All inquiries for information relating to our webinar should be directed to ddiwebinars at fda.hhs.gov. We hope you'll enjoy meeting our presenter today. Dr. Winlei Jung is a senior biomedical research and biomedical product assessment service expert and currently serves as a senior advisor for innovation and strategic outreach in the Office of Research and Standards in the Office of Generic Drugs. She is leading complex drug product classification and research, promoting global harmonization of bioequivalence criteria, developing opportunities for scientific outreach, and coordinating post-market generic drug safety investigation. Prior to joining FDA, she was at Novartis Pharmaceutical Corporation, where her responsibilities included formulation development of conventional liquid and solid dosage forms, as well as advanced parenteral drug delivery systems. She received her PhD in pharmaceutics and pharmaceutical chemistry from the Ohio State University. Now, please give a warm online welcome to Dr. Jung. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this FDA Drug Topics webinar. My name is Wen Lei Jiang. I'm from Office of Research and Standards, Office of Generic Drugs, CDAR US FDA. It is my great pleasure today to present Understanding Generic Narrow Therapeutic Index Drugs. I would like to thank FDA Division of Drug Information staff for their invitation and the coordination about this webinar. So I have this great opportunity to share with you about generic NTI drugs. The views expressed in this presentation are my personal view and not necessarily those of US FDA. In my presentation today, I will first introduce what are NTI drugs and their characteristics. Then I will discuss US FDA's bioequivalence and quality standards for NTI drugs, followed by global bioequivalence standards of NTI drugs and FDA's post-market research on generic NTI drugs. I hope after my presentation, you can recognize general characteristics of NTI drugs accurately describe FDA's approach and criteria to evaluate the bioequivalence of generic NTI drugs. You may explain some FDA's post-market research of NTI drugs and list opportunities to facilitate global generic NTI drug development and increase generic NTI substitution. I also prepared some challenge questions at the end of the talk so we have another chance to review the key takeaway messages. So what is narrow therapeutic index drug? Narrow therapeutic index drugs are those drugs where small differences in drug dose or concentration may lead to serious therapeutic failure and or adverse drug reactions that are life-threatening or result in persistent or significant disability or incapacity.
There are some general characteristics of NTI drugs. For NTI drugs, generally there is little separation between therapeutic and the toxic doses or associated blood plasma concentrations. That is, the estimated toxic to effective concentration ratio is around two or three. Another characteristic is that Sub-therapeutic concentrations of the NTI drug may lead to serious therapeutic failure. Also, NTI drugs are often subject to therapeutic monitoring based on pharmacokinetic or pharmacodynamic measures. NTI drugs possess low to moderate within subject variability, that is less than 30%. In clinical practice, NTI drug doses are often adjusted in very small increments, for example, less than 20%. In the past decade, FDA has made great efforts in ensuring generic NTI drug safety and efficacy. In the pre-approval area, FDA has developed consistent process to classify NTI drugs and revised its bioequivalence criteria for NTI drugs. FDA also continues its efforts to encourage drug manufacturers to apply quality by design in pharmaceutical drug development. In the post-market area, FDA used a number of approaches to ensure the safe use of generic NTI drugs, including strengthening surveillance efforts via both passive and active methods. In addition, FDA funded bioequivalent studies to confirm NTI drug bioequivalence in patients. Besides these hard science efforts, FDA also touched upon some soft science area and tried to understand whether patient, ph pharmacists, and the physicians' perceptions may affect the use of generic NTI drugs. The texts highlighted in red here are the focus of my presentation today. So how do we determine if a drug is NTI drug or not? First, I would like to share with you about FDA's streamlined NTI classification process. Basically, we examine the drug to see if it has some of the general characteristics of NTI drugs mentioned earlier. This slide shows the data sources and approach we rely on to collect the drug information for the NTI classification. We look into drug product labeling, uh, new drug application and abbreviated new drug application package, uh, literature reports to find out find out drug PK properties, uh, dose response relationship, also clinical practice data and PKPD modeling are important tools for us to help classify NTI drug. Next, I will illustrate the process step by step how we classify drug as NTI. As I mentioned earlier, one important aspect in NTI classification is to determine if sub-therapeutic concentration will cause severe therapeutic failures and adverse events. For example, if the plasma concentration of an anti-epileptic drug is below the therapeutic range, the patient may have seizure. Seizure is considered as a severe therapeutic failure. All ineffective immunosuppressants may cause organ rejection. Organ rejection is also considered as severe therapeutic failure. However, uh, if a common cold medicine did not work properly, the health risk is relatively small. I believe most people would not consider a common cold medicine as an NTI drug. Another key question in NTI classification is to determine if this drug will cause severe adverse events. The severe uh, toxic adverse events can be uh, hematological, 
uh, cardiovascular and neurologic related. Um, here, I also want to point out only those dependent drug substance related adverse events are included to support classification of NTI. If an excipient in the drug product leads to severe toxicity, that will not be considered for the classification of NTI. A challenge in NTI classification is how to quantify the differences between effective drug concentration and the concentrations associated with serious toxicity. Here are some methods we use to determine whether a drug has little separation between its toxic and the therapeutic doses and concentrations. Ideally, we want to have the individual subject information about the toxic and effective drug concentration. However, these data are rarely available. Therefore, we estimate the toxic and effective drug concentration based on population level PKPD data and a therapeutic range. Uh, for example, Femitoin's therapeutic range is 10 to 20 microgram per mil plasma concentration uh, associated with uh, serious toxicity is reported to be greater than uh, 40 microgram per ml. The midpoint of the therapeutic range is about 15 microgram per ml. The toxic effective concentration ratio is estimated by dividing the toxic concentration by the midpoint of the therapeutic range, approximately 2.7. Uh, in addition, uh, therapeutic drug monitoring and a small dose adjustment can be a hint of steep exposure response relationship within individuals. Therefore, uh, little separation between toxic and the to uh, therapeutic doses is anticipated. NTI drugs generally have small to medium within subject variability, that is less than 30%. Within subject variability refers to a measure of variability in blood concentration within the same subject, when the subject is administered two doses of the same formulation. Within subject variability is usually obtained from replicated study design where the drug product is given to the subject twice. When such data uh, is not available, we can estimate the within subject variability via root mean square error, RMSE values of the PK parameters Cmax and AUC from single dose two-way crossover B studies. This table listed the mean within subject variability for AUC and CMAX for products generally considered as NTI. As you can see from this table, uh, the within subject variability are all below 30%. If a drug has high within subject variability, for example, greater than 30%, it is highly likely uh, this drug is not an NTI drug because its large plasma concentration fluctuations in the same patients did not lead to large fluctuations in its clinical safety and efficacy. For the drugs with uh, within subject variability greater than 30%, they are considered as highly variable drug. Many NTI drugs are subject to therapeutic drug monitoring and or pharmacodynamics uh, monitoring. However, not all drugs subject to therapeutic monitoring are NTI drugs. We need to understand the monitoring purpose, frequency of monitoring, whether the monitoring is only in special population or not. For example, uh, whether this, is, uh, uh, this TDM is only uh, down during uh, the pregnancy. When the clinical use of the drug involves small dose adjustments of less than 
there is a implicit assumption that product variation and specifically variation introduced by generic uh, substitution be less than the size of uh, those adjustments. We can check whether multiple dose strengths are available for the dose adjustment uh, for a product. In addition, drug-drug interaction data or food effect label can give us a clue how much PK change was considered significant requiring a dose adjustment. In the dose, is a dose adjustment in small increments or not? For NTI drug, the dosage adjust, adjustment is in small increments, that is uh, less than 20%. So based on the described process, we evaluated a number of FDA approved products and concluded that uh, phenytoin, carbamazepine, and the vaporic acid, tacrolimus are NTI drugs. They have all the general characteristics of NTI. Uh, Topiramate, namotrogen, levosiracetam are not considered as NTI drugs. For example, the estimated toxic to effective ratio is not what established for topiramid, and there is no routine uh, therapeutic drug monitoring needed for topiramid. Uh, in this case, topiramid is not considered an NTI drug. Uh, currently, FDA has a, a NTI working group. Uh, one role of this working group is to discuss NTI drug classification based on the relevant information from new drug development programs and literature sources with a science and risk-based holistic regulatory approach uh, we just mentioned. Uh, this working group has conducted NTI classification of more than uh, 20 drug products. Based on their evaluation, actually most of the evaluated drug products are not classified as NTI drugs. Uh, some other roles of this working group include establishing a consistent process to resolve key NTI-related scientific and regulatory issues in a transparent and collaborative manner, creating a consistent process for monitoring and re-evaluating NTI drugs in the early post-marketing stage to support timely availability of product-specific guidance recommendation for generic drug development. So I introduced you the concept of NTI drugs and illustrated the process to classify drug as NTI. Next, I will introduce you generic drugs, the approval basis of generic drugs, and updated by equivalence and quality standards for NTI drugs. Generic drugs are copies of their respective reference listed drugs. Oftentimes, uh, ROD, reference listed drug, is a brand product. Generic drugs have the same active ingredients, dosage form, strengths, route of administration, condition of use, and the labeling uh, with uh, certain limited uh, exceptions. They must also demonstrate bioequivalence and ensure product's identity, strengths, quality, and purity. However, generic drugs can differ from the ROD in terms of appearance, in active ingredients, formulation design, and manufacturing process. Generic drugs are often sold at a lower price than the brand name counterpart. According to 2021 US Generics and Biosimilar Medicines Savings Report prepared by Association for Accessible Medicines, generic drugs account for 18.1% of total medicine spending, savings from generics and biosimilars totaled 
of around $338 billion uh, in 2020. There are quite some similarities as well as differences for new drug approval and generic drug approval. Uh, to gain drug product approval, brand name drug manufacturer submits new drug application, NDA, while generic drug applicants submit abbreviated new drug application, ANDA. NDA and ANDA share similar information such as chemistry, manufacturing, testing, inspection, and labeling. However, generic applicants do not need repeat large-scale animal studies or clinical studies to demonstrate drug safety and efficacy. Uh, as we said earlier, the generic uh, product contains the same active ingredients as the corresponding NDA product. The drug safety and efficacy already demonstrated uh, in the previously approved NDAs. Therefore, generic applicants can use a bioequivalent study to bridge this safety and efficacy information. Uh, here, bioequivalence means the test drug has the same rate and extent of absorption as a reference drug. Uh, according to regulation, different types of evidence may be used to establish bioequivalence, including in vivo pharmacokinetic study, uh, in vivo pharmacodynamic comparison, clinical endpoint study, uh, in vitro comparison, and any other approach deemed appropriate by US FDA. The most common bioequivalence approach is a single dose two-way crossover in vivo pharmacokinetic study conducted in 24 to 36 healthy subjects. Uh, the subjects will be randomized in two groups. One group takes the test product first. Uh, blood samples will be withdrawn uh, after uh, will be drawn after a washout period. The subjects will take the brand product and the blood samples are drawn. Another group will take the brand first and then the test uh, product. Here, uh, this figure shows that uh, the typical blood concentration profile after uh, drug administration. Uh, I just want to point out two important pharmacokinetic parameters we evaluate for bioequivalence demonstration. One is a maximum drug concentration, which reflects the rate of absorption. The other is the area under the curve, uh, abbreviated as AUC, which reflects the extent of absorption. Uh, if the 90% confidence interval of the geometric mean ratio of the test to reference for CMAX and AUC falls within 80 to 125 percent, the compared two products can claim bioequivalence. Uh, in summary, to gain generic drug approval, the product needs show pharmaceutical equivalence, that is, the same API dosage form conform to appropriate quality standards, and also bioequivalence, the same rate and extent of absorption. Approved generics are considered therapeutically equivalent to the reference drug and can be freely substitutable with the brand name drugs. The commonly used bioequivalence uh, limit is 80 to 125 percent. This limit is based on the premise that the 20 percent difference between test and the reference product is not clinically uh, significant. For highly variable drugs, uh, here um, represented by the light blue uh, color, whose within subject variability is greater than 30%, a large number of subjects are needed to pass by equivalent standards 
if we use conventional uh, two-way crossover study. For highly variable drugs, uh, 80 to 125 percent B limits may be too tight if we use a uh, conventional two-way crossover study. Uh, for a drug with low variability, for example, uh, NTI drugs, um, the brand and generic products may pass B criteria, but with a larger difference in the mean response, pictured here as uh, red and blue. Uh, the large difference in mean CMAX or AUC of brand and generic products may cause large plasma concentration fluctuation when patients switch between uh, these two products, potentially resulting in therapeutic failure or serious adverse events. As such, the conventional 80 to 125 percent B limit may not be sufficient for NTI drugs. At the 2010 FDA Advisory Committee meeting for pharmaceutical science, the advisory committee concluded that uh, one size by equivalence criteria do not fit all drugs. The average B limits of 80 to 125% are not sufficient for NTI drugs. Uh, the requirements for uh, uh, confidence interval should perhaps be narrower uh, than 19-211%. And uh, replicated studies are important. These are the suggestions from the FDA Advisory Committee back in uh, 2010. So, this slide summarized uh, by equivalent study design tailored for different drug, uh, drug products uh, by FDA. Um, for non-NTI, non-highly variable drug, we recommend single dose two-way crossover study design and compare the mean CMAX and AUC of brand and generic. If the 90% confidence interval of the ge geometric mean ratio of generic to brand fall within 80 to 125%, the two products are considered uh, by equivalent. Uh, there is no variability comparison of these products. For highly variable drugs, that is the within septic variability greater than 30%, we recommend either partially replicated three crossover or fully replicated four-way crossover study, that is, uh, giving the, uh, give the reference product twice, general product either once or twice. Uh, since the reference product is given twice, we can get the within subject variability of the reference product. So um, the 90% confidence interval will be scaled wider based on the within subject variability of the reference uh, product. So for highly variable drug, the bioequivalence uh, interval is usually wider than 80 to 125%. Uh, we also apply the point estimate constraint on the geometric mean ratio. For the highly variable drug, we also don't uh, apply a variability comparison. For NTI drugs, uh, we recommend single dose, fully replicated four way crossover study. That is, the reference product given twice and the generic product given twice. In this way, we can get the within subject variability of both reference and the test products. For NTI drugs, we recommend the mean of uh, geometric mean ratio of test to reference products must pass both the reference scale limits and the unscaled average by equivalence limits of 80 to 125 percent. For NTI drugs, the within subject variability is often lower than 30 percent, so the reference scale limit is usually narrower than 80 to 125 percent, opposite to the highly variable drugs. In addition, since the variability of test and reference are both available with fully replicated study design, 
for NTI drugs, we not only uh, recommend mean comparison, but also ask for variability comparison. That is the upper limit of the 90% confidence interval of the ratio of test to reference within subject variability no greater than 2.5%. Uh, please note, this is a one-sided test. It is acceptable as long as the test product variability is not higher than the reference product variability. Uh, I know this slide uh, contains a lot of uh, information. Uh, to simplify, please just focus on the B requirements of uh, NTI. The take-home message here is that FDA requires both mean and the variability comparison for NTI drugs. Uh, for the mean comparison, the 90% confidence interval is scaled based on the reference drug within subject variability, narrower or equal to 80 to uh, 125 percent. This slide gives you some visual about what reference scale B limits mean for NTI drugs. Here, B limits will change as a function of the within subject variability of the reference product. As shown in uh, this figure on the left, uh, if the within subject variability of reference is around 10%, the 90% confidence interval will be within 90 to 111%, not conventional 80 to 125%. When the within subject variability of reference is about 5%, the B limits will be further narrowed to about 95 to 105. As you can see, uh, these limits are much tighter for NTI drugs than non-NTI drugs. Uh, when when the within subject variability of reference is greater than 21.4%, the B limit uh, will be never wider, but remain as 80 to 125%. Uh, in addition, for the quality standard, uh, there are also tighter AC limits for NTI drugs compared to non-NTI drugs that is uh, uh, 95 to 105% for NTI drugs. For non-NTI drugs, the AC limit is 90 to 110%. Uh, in 2011, uh, we presented the new bioequivalence uh, approach and criteria, as well as uh, the tighter AC standards to FDA advisory committee uh, the FDA Advisory Committee uh, supported the adoption of this new criteria to evaluate NTI drugs. Um, now you know that US FDA apply tighter by equivalence and quality standards for NTI drugs. How about other regulatory agencies? Next, I will go over by equivalent standards from several other record agencies and discuss further opportunities for global harmonization. Um, before we discuss about uh, standards, let's review how other agencies describe NTI drugs. Uh, the term used and the definitions about NTI drugs vary among different regulatory bodies. Uh, Health Canada used the term critical dose drugs. Uh, Japan PMDA named it narrow therapeutic range drugs. Uh, EMA uh, and uh, um, uh, South Africa Medicine Control Council used the term narrow therapeutic index drugs. Um, and FDA and Health Canada uh, provide regulatory descriptions for NTI drugs and critical dose drugs, uh, respectively, while other uh, regulatory bodies do not have specific description for uh, NTI drugs. Uh, here is a list of NTI drugs, uh, all critical dose drugs, uh, categorized by different uh, regulatory agencies. 
uh, this is not meant as a complete list. However, uh, as you can see, PMDA does have a longer uh, NTI uh, drug list. This slide summarizes the uh, bioequivalence uh, approach and criteria for critical dose drugs or NTI drugs. As shown in this table, uh, Health Canada and EMA used a uh, direct tightening of the VE limits to 90 uh, to 111 uh, percent uh, for AUC. Uh, South Africa and the PMDA has a VE limits of 80 to 125 percent uh, for both AUC and CMAX. Uh, like for FDA, as I presented earlier, apply reference scale limits for the mean comparison and also compare the generic and the reference variability for both uh, CMAX and AUC. Uh, besides US FDA, China Regulatory Agency, uh, National Medicine Products Administration, ANPA, uh, which I didn't include in this table, also apply the same criteria as uh, US FDA. Uh, compared to Health Canada and EMA approach, uh, FDA approach is more flexible and also offered additional comparison of test and the reference variability. Um, I, we believe uh, actually based on our uh, uh, investigation, in some cases, the 90 to 111 percent may be too stringent for some of the NTI drug products. Um, in summary, NTI definition, list of NTI drugs, by equipment's approach criteria for NTI drugs vary among different regulatory bodies. There is a strong need to harmonize by equipment's criteria for NTI drug products. Uh, in 2019, an ICH reflection paper was published to propose further, opportunity, further opportunities for harmonization of standards for generic drugs. Uh, it was proposed to develop a series of ICH guidelines on standards for demonstrating equivalence for non-complex dosage forms first, and then moving to guideline development of more complex dosage forms or products. So after the publication of ICH reflection paper on generic drugs, an ICH M13 working group was formed to uh, develop bioequivalence guidelines for immediate release solid oral dosage forms. The first stage is to work on general considerations and the principles on bioequivalent study design, data analysis. Then this working group is going to work on bioweaver for additional strengths, uh, advanced B study design considerations, data analysis and B assessment for highly variable drugs and the narrow therapeutic index drugs. So as you can see, uh, NTI evaluation uh, is a topic of uh, global harmonization. Um, yeah, in the earlier section of my talk, I shared with uh, you FDA's efforts in pre-approval area to ensure generic NTI drug safety and efficacy, including uh, streamlined NTI classification and more stringent by equipment's criteria for NTI drugs. Next, uh, I will highlight some post-market research and perceptions of generic NTI drugs. The first post-market research study I would like to share is uh, Levothyroxine. Levothyroxine is considered an NTI drug by USFDA. Uh, the objective of this study is to compare the effectiveness of genetic versus brand levothyroxine in achieving and maintaining normal thyrotropin level among new levothyroxine users. 
this is a retrospective study using the administrative claims database linked to laboratory results from commercially insured and uh, uh, Medicaid Advantage enrollees throughout the U.S. Uh, eligible patients were adults uh, with serotonin levels ranging from uh, 4.5 to 19.9 unit who initiated use of generic or brand levothyroxine from January 1, 2008 to October 1, 2017. Uh, about uh, 17,000 patients' data were analyzed. It was found that a similar proportion of generic versus brand name nifthyroxine users achieved target serotropin levels. Uh, these findings suggest that initiation of generic or brand nifthyroxine for mild uh, thyroid dysfunction is associated with similar rates of achieving target laboratory outcomes. The next study is on warfarin, a very typical NTI drug. Uh, the anticoagulant response to warfarin increases uh, with age, which may make older patients susceptible to adverse outcomes resulting uh, from small differences in bioavailability between generic and brand products. Uh, so the objective of this study is to evaluate whether outcomes are comparable between generic warfarin products and brand warfarin in patients older than uh, 65 years. Using US Medicare claims linked to electronic medical records from two large hospitals in uh, Boston, the researchers designed an observational cohort study of uh, uh, 33,645 uh, uh, patients, uh, uh, like 65 years or older, who initiated warfarin. And uh, uh, these patients were followed for a uh, composite effectiveness outcome of stroke or venous uh, uh, thrombo uh, thromboembolism. Uh, a composite safety out outcome, including a major hemorrhage and a one-year all-cause mortality outcome. Uh, again, in this study, no differences were observed in patients taking generic or brand warfarin. The last research study I want to share is about uh, pharmacists' perceptions of generic NTI drugs. I believe most audiences uh, for this webinar are pharmacists. So please check if this study resonates with your experiences. Um, in this study, pharmacists were surveyed to identify their perceptions of generic NTI drugs. Uh, their frequency of performing generic NTI substitution and the predictors of uh, uh, such behavior. So of 710 respondents, 87% of respondents perceived uh, generic NTI drugs as effective as their brand name counterpart, and 94% as safe well as 82% almost always perform generic NTI substitution for initial prescriptions. Only 60% did for refills, however. Yeah, pharmacists in non-chain settings uh, in pharmacy practice longer, in states with affirmative patient consent laws, and in states with NTI-specific uh, substitution requirements, were more likely not to substitute initial prescription. So this study suggests that education of non-chain and the veteran pharmacists and the elimination of affirmative patient consent and NTI-specific substitution requirements could potentially increase 
uh, generic NTI substitution. Now we come to the conclusion slide. Uh, I hope with this presentation, you have a better understanding about generic NTI drugs and FDA's commitment to ensure generic NTI drug safety and efficacy. Uh, in the past decade, FDA has undertaken great efforts to enhance public confidence on generic NTI drugs. In my talk, I have highlighted FDA's efforts in developing novel bioequivalence approach and criteria for NTI drugs. This B approach involves fully replicated study design, that is, give the brand product twice to the subjects, a generic product uh, also twice to the subjects, so we can obtain the within subject variability of the brand and the generic products. The bioequivalence limits will be scaled based on the within subject variability of the reference drug. Uh, in the meantime, we conduct variability comparison for the brand and the generic product. In addition, FDA has established process to classify NTI drugs uh, consistently and uh, tighten both quality and the bioequivalent standards for NTI drugs. Um, two case studies I shared here demonstrated therapeutic equivalence of generic NTI drug products to its corresponding reference drug. Education of non-chain and veteran pharmacists and the elimination of affirmative patient consent and NTI-specific substitution requirements could increase generic NTI substitution. Uh, also, FDA is working closely with other regulatory agencies to further harmonize NTI by equivalence approaches and criteria. Here are some references uh, for this presentation. Uh, please refer to this, uh, uh, some of the publication and uh, uh, presentation slides to learn more about NTI drugs and uh, by equivalent standards. Uh, finally, I would like to thank CEDAR Narrow Therapy Index Drug by equivalent standards working group for developing the bioequivalence uh, approach and the criteria for NTI drugs back in uh, 2012. Uh, Dr. Feroz uh, uh, Makloff is a key statistician supporting this project. Uh, Dr. Yu is a key driver to updating uh, generic NTI bioequivalence criteria. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Cersei grants to Yale University and Mayo Clinic uh, FDA Office of Chief Scientist grant contract to Brigham and Women's Hospital Research Team uh, to support research studies I cited in this talk. And also, uh, uh, many thanks go to ORS uh, management, Dr. Zhang and Dr. Leyenberg and the OGD communication staff for their support to this webinar. The first question coming in, you listed five general characteristics of NTI drugs. Does a drug need to meet all five criteria to be considered as an NTI drug? Yeah, this is an excellent question. Uh, the simple answer is no. It is not necessary for a drug meeting all five criteria to be considered as an NTI drug. It is more of a holistic approach to assess whether a drug is NTI or not. Um, I would say of uh, these uh, characteristics, some are weighted uh, more than the other. Uh, for example, it is important to know if a drug has uh, estimated toxic to effective concentration ratio around two or three. Uh, if the toxic to effective concentration ratio is very high, for example, 10 in the lambotrogen case, we can rule out it is a NTI drug. A another key feature of NTI drug is that it possesses low to moderate within subject variability, that is less than 30%. Uh, 
if a drug has high witness subject variability, for example, greater than 30%, we can also rule out it is an NTI drug. Uh, if sub-therapeutic concentration of a drug will cause uh, severe uh, therapeutic failure and adverse events and has low toxic to effective concentration ratio, and also this drug has low within subject variability, and uh, it, it is subject to therapeutic drug monitoring, but we may not have the information about small dose adjustment in clinical practice. In this case, we may still classify the drug as a NTI drug. Hope, hopefully, uh, this answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jung. Okay, I know we're at 201. Let's take just one more question before we end. The second question, what's the value of reference scaled approach for NTI drug products? Again, that's also an uh, excellent question. So based on my presentation, you know that a US FDA and China NMPA are the only two agencies which recommend reference scaled approach for NTI drugs, while most other agencies, including EMA and Health Canada, apply just the direct tightening of B limits to 90 to 111 uh, percent. The advantage of reference scaled approach is that it considers the within subject variability of, uh, uh, of the reference product. So the bioequivalence limits will be scaled narrower than 80 to 125% based on the within subject variability of the reference product. Um, yeah, I just want to repeat here, if the within subject variability of the reference product is small, the B limits will be narrower. For example, if it is 5%, the B limit will be around 95 to 105. If the uh, uh, within subject variability is 10%, the B limit will be around 90 to 110, which coincides with uh, EMA's uh, limit for NTI drug. So these B limits are flexible and uh, reasonable. Uh, for the EMA's approach, direct tightening to 90 to 111%, regardless of the within subject variability uh, is low or medium. Um, the, the disadvantage of that uh, approach is that it will lead to unnecessarily and also unreasonably stringent criteria for a drug uh, with moderate within subject variability. For example, uh, if a drug, uh, NTI drug has within subject variability of 20%, uh, then it will be very difficult uh, for uh, the application to uh, meet the 90 to 111% uh, B limits. And the generic applicants have to recruit a large number of subjects to pass the bioequivalent study. Yeah, hope this. Uh, uh, help you understand the, the advantage of this reference scaled approach for NTI drug. Okay, thank you so much, Winlay. We are out of time since we're almost at the 205 mark. If you have questions that we did not have time to address today, please email them to our Division of Drug Information email address at druginfo at fda.hhs.gov for assistance. This concludes our activity for today. The FDA appreciates your participation in this webinar, and we hope that you will join us again in the future. If you need more CEs for your license renewals this year, please check out our list of home study CE webinars at www.fda.gov slash DDI webinars. We have about 22 listed. Um, you may also find additional free CE credits, such as FDA's drug regulation course titled FDA's Role in Public Health, Drug Efficacy, Safety, Quality, and Beyond on our CDER Learn website by entering CDER Learn in the search engine on FDA.gov. Thank you all for attending and please stay safe and healthy this holiday season. Take care.